Good evening. On behalf of Swinburne, the Mundani Terminal Centre and the Centre for Astrophysics and Supercomputing, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2019 Swinburne Annual Reconciliation Lecture. My name is Andrew Gunston. I'm the Executive Director of Reconciliation Strategy and Leadership and Executive Director of the Mundani Terminal Centre at Swinburne. I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on who we're meeting tonight, and pay my respects to the Elders, past, present and future. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here tonight, and acknowledge the continuing sovereignties of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. It is a great pleasure to welcome Wurundjeri Elder, Aunty Georgina Nicholson. Aunty Georgina is passionate about promoting Wurundjeri warrior on culture, and frequently represents Wurundjeri Warrior on Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation, which is the peak body representing the traditional owners of Melbourne and surrounding territories at events for the general public. I'd like to invite Aunty Georgina to deliver the welcome to country. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Is yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That was a beautiful introduction. Womanjika, welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Georgina Nicholson and I am a proud Wurundjeri woman. Wurundjeri being part of the Kulin Nation. The Kulin Nation consists of five clans and they are Wurundjeri, Boonwurrung, Wathurrung, Tunnerung, and Jaja Wurrung. Wurundjeri being all of Melbourne CBD and surrounding country, extending north to the Great Dividing Range, east to Mount Borbor, south to Mordialic Creek and west to the mouth of Werribee River. I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to our ancestors who walked this land as free spirits, to our elders past, present and future, to all Aboriginal here tonight, non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here tonight, also other elders which I know there's quite a few here that I admire. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge Chancellor John Polares, Professor. I'm going to say that again, hang on. Chancellor Professor John Polares, OAM. Vice Chancellor and President Professor Linda Christiansen, AO. Senior Win Swinburne Executives, Staff and guests, you'll have to excuse me with my speech because I'm dragging myself around at the moment. <laughs> it's a busy week, so I'll try and get this out right. Woman Jika Wurundjeri Balak Yemen Kundibik. So I would just like to tell you what I've said in our Woiwurrung language, and that is welcome to the land of the Wurundjeri people. My mother, Martha Margaret Nicholson Nee Terrick, was delivered by her grandmother. Granny Jemima, and that was under a tree on Corran Dirk Aboriginal Mission near Hillsville. So Mummy was already learning the importance of family and culture. Years later, Mummy met a deadly, deadly Irish man called Patrick, and they met on a blind date in Melbourne in the early 1930s. In 1937, Mummy and Daddy were married back then. It was in a registry office. And they had 16 children. Yeah, I know, it's wow. <laughs> eight girls, eight boys, no twins, all single babies. So that's pretty good. Myself being the youngest and the oldest is my big sister, Pat Ockwell. Pat Ockwell is an amazing uh, senior active elder. She's resting at the moment from a big operation she had some time back. But it was a very big operation, but she's doing really well. But she's got to slow down a bit. But when she's active, she is active. She's involved in so many things. Um, so Sister Pat, as a young girl, gave up her dreams to stay at home with mummy and help with all the babies coming. So apparently she wanted to be an Olympian in the Olympics. So what a big dream. But, you know, she gave it up and helped. And I can remember her doing things when I was little and I was being naughty, so when I was a little girl. But um, yeah, um, amazing there helping mummy. For daddy was in the Air Force, so he had to take, keep taking leave all the time. So he ended up getting a job in the local sawmill in Hillsville. 
rode a push bike back then. That was before we could get a car. So, um, you know, it's pretty amazing. The Aboriginal culture, look, I say 80,000 years plus, but I have been advised by a senior elder that it's 120,000 years plus, and it's growing all the time with the research, with what's happening. So, look, Aboriginal culture is the oldest living, resilient culture there is. So I'm very proud of my heritage, you know, um, of my mother being a full Aboriginal and my dad was Irish. Um, sadly, both our parents have now passed away and there are only eight of us kids alive. So we recently lost a brother. So, um, yeah, you know, we must carry on the culture for our people, most importantly for our future generations to teach what we can to them and they keep it going for us, as, as I'm doing here tonight for my ancestors. And my, I come from a very long, strong, unbroken line of female matriarchs, from Annie Barat right down to my mum and all the women in between, Annie Winnie, all oh, just amazing matriarchs. So um, we have an office at the Abbotsford Convent in the Providence Building upstairs if you'd like to pop in there and have a cup of tea with some of the elders or the CEO, you'd be more than welcome. Um, I think I might wrap it up there because I know we've got a bit to go through. So thank you all for coming and thank you for having me here to do the welcome for you all tonight and um, have a nice evening. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Linda Christensen, AO, Vice-Chancellor and President of Swinburne. Professor Christensen drives Swinburne's vision to be a world-class university, creating social and economic impact through science, technology and innovation. Professor Christensen also leads Swinburne on our journey of reconciliation and our engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I'd like to invite Professor Christensen to join us. Thank you very much, Andrew. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we're gathered this evening, the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And a very warm and special thank you to Auntie Georgina Nicholson for your gracious uh, and forgiving welcome to country. Um, I feel like you're part of the family. I know we call upon you often, and we really uh, treasure your wisdom and your sharing with us. I would also like to acknowledge our Chancellor, Professor John Polaire's OAM. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence tonight. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Ian Hamm, who I believe is here tonight as well. Ian is the uh, chair of the First Nations Foundation, and he is also chair of our Reconciliation Action Plan Steering Committee, and has been uh, a source of wise advice to me. So it's wonderful. I would also like to uh, welcome our panelists, uh, Gunai and Yorta Yorta Man, Uncle Wayne Thorpe. Thank you for being here. Astronomer and Senior Research Fellow at Monash University, Dr. Duane Hamaker. Thank you, Duane. Uh, Kamalari woman and Monash U astrophysicist student, Crystal DiNapoli. Thank you, Crystal. And of course, our panel MC tonight is our own Professor G Georgina, uh, Virginia, 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 I'll try it again. <laughs> I've got Georgina in my mind. Virginia. Uh, <laughs> it's going to just get worse, isn't it? I love Virginia, and I'll say it correctly now. Virginia Kilborn, the Dean of the School of Science at Swinburne. <clears throat> I have other skills, don't worry. <laughs> I'd also like to say a special thank you to the, to the teams from the Mundani Tumadul Center and the Center for Astrophysics and Supercomputing who have brought this very special event to life tonight. As a university, we are dedicated to ensuring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's heritage, knowledge, and cultures are recognized by our community and are embedded in our work. Our annual reconciliation lecture is one of many ways that we show our commitment to reconciliation and understanding. It's a key feature of our Elevate Reconciliation Action Plan. It is also a platform to acknowledge and celebrate indigenous voices and experts strengthening our ties with indigenous communities. And it is integral to Swinburne's learning journey. We are all here to learn. 
the journey we undertake as part of this reconciliation process. This year we have much to celebrate. As many of you may have already heard yesterday, Swinburne declared its strong and unwavering commitment to reconciliation when we announced our support for the Uluru Statement from the Heart as part of a joint response with other leading Australian organisations. The Uluru Statement... <coughs> It supports First Nations peoples to have a voice in federal parliament, paving the way for reconciliation and understanding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Swinburne worked with the Reconciliation Australia and many of our Elevate RAP partners to express a clear, united response to the Uluru Statement. In declaring our support, Swinburne joins the thousands of Australians, individuals, communities and organisations all calling for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to be heard at the highest levels. It is an important moment for us as an organisation and I'm pleased to share this announcement with you tonight as we celebrate National Reconciliation Week together. Over many years, Swinburne has built strong relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their communities. We have learned that broad and meaningful cultural change requires a sustained and significant commitment. This ongoing commitment through our RAP has helped us achieve important outcomes, both with and for our Indigenous students and our community. These include the fact that we've had a 60% increase in the number of Indigenous students who are studying higher education with us, and a 43% increase in vocational education, all just since 2016. Strengthened partnerships with our Richmond Football Club and the Koran Gamaji Institute to create opportunities for leadership and employment pathways has also been an important feature and action that we take together. Last year, we established the Mundani Tumundal Centre, which is responsible for all Indigenous matters at Swinburne and brings this lecture to you tonight. The Centre has been instrumental in understanding, addressing and progressing reconciliation across our organisation, from students and staff through to industry, partners and the broader community. For example, last year we co-hosted with the um, Reconciliation Australia and the Richmond Football Club, Club the first National Reconciliation Action Plan Conference. And we had more than 400 people attend, and we had people on the waiting list that wished they could have come. It was an important moment and an important conversation that we, we worked together to try and open up and engage in a broader way. More than words, these are the real projects and programs that we hope will help us remain true to the spirit of reconciliation, to strengthening relationships and understanding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians for the benefit of all of us. And now to tonight's event. It is more than fitting that our panel tonight is First Nations astronomers. Swinburne is at the forefront of the rapidly emerging Australian space sector. We have the longest running online astronomy postgraduate course in Australia. As part of our exploration of space and space technology, we use and measure astronomical quantities of data through OSTAR one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, located right here at our Hawthorne campus. We view the distant universe using the giant 10-meter Keck telescopes, which I have been fortunate to visit in Hawaii on the Big Island. And we control them from the Baker Institute here, which is a remote observing room right here on our campus. Recently, we helped a group of high school students send teeth into space. Now, why would you send teeth into space? They went to the International Space Station, guided by our researchers, to create this experiment, which would help them understand, and all of us understand, the effects of microgravity on tooth decay. Talk about a way to inspire young people to pursue science. Just as the Australian space industry and our place within it is expanding, so too is our thirst for knowledge and understanding of indigenous astronomy. Indigenous astronomy is a topic that challenges both our understanding and awareness of the significant body of knowledge, the continuity and connectedness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, astronomy and space. Tonight, we welcome our expert panel to guide us on this journey of discovery as we explore First Nations first astronomers. And we will all be the richer for it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. As the Vice Chancellor mentioned, we had the inaugural National Reconciliation Action Plan conference last year. One of the outcomes from this very successful conference was the development of an Elevate RAP network. This network, which includes Swinburne, comprises of 24 organisations that have been recognised by Reconciliation Australia as having their RAPs at the highest level of Elevate. The Elevate RAP network was formed with the aim of significantly influencing the national reconciliation agenda. One of our first projects was to develop a joint response to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The Uluru Statement was written at a 2017 convention. It's handed by 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It calls for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. An Amarikarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. As the Vice-Chancellor mentioned, Swinburne yesterday declared our support for the Uluru Statement from the heart. We join with 13 other Elevate organisations in the joint response to this statement. We'd like to show you the video of this joint response. We represent diverse organisations across a range of sectors. Collectively, we educate, employ and provide services to people across all of Australia. Together, we make this response to the Uluru Statement from the heart. Thank you for your invitation to walk with you. In a movement of all Australian people for a better future. We recognise the Uluru Statement from the Heart as an historic mandate to create a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. We hear the call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. And for a referendum to amend the Constitution accordingly. We hear your call for a Makarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In a spirit of reconciliation, we look forward to working with and supporting you as a matter of national priority to develop and enact specific proposals in relation to voice, treaty and truth. We call upon our people, industry colleagues and fellow Australians to join us, join us, join us, join us in this important national dialogue. I would like to acknowledge the Chancellor Professor John Pilars, AOM, the Vice Chancellor Professor Linda Christensen, AO, the University Council and the Executive Group, particularly Vice President Engagement Jane Ward for their strong leadership and support on this response. I would also like to acknowledge the expertise of Swimmers Media and Communications team for their tremendous work in helping develop this communications material. The Swinburne Annual Reconciliation Lecture is designed to advance understandings in the wider community about reconciliation. As the Vice-Chancellor said, it's a key element of our 2017-19 Elevate Reconciliation Action Plan. So 2019 is the International Year of Indigenous Languages, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, and the year Indigenous astronomy was included in the Australian National Curriculum. Those have spawned a number of activities and scholarship between astronomers, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders across Australia. It is now with great pleasure I welcome and introduce our panellists to the 2019 Swinburne Annual Reconciliation Lecture. Please welcome Gunai and Yorta Yorta custodian, Uncle Wayne Thorpe. <laughs> Camilla Roy Woman and astrophysics student, Crystal D. Napoli. Cultural astronomer, Dr. Dwayne Hamacher. And the panel will be chaired by Professor Virginia Kilburn, Dean of the School of Science at Swinburne. Please welcome again the panelists and panel tonight. everybody and thank you for um, the animators who've made that beautiful presentation. Um, to begin with I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and, uh, and emerging, emerging 
Um, these are the traditional custodians of the lands which Swinburne's campuses are located. And I'd also like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, uh, Torres Strait nations across Australia and their elders and ancestors, cultures and heritage, and especially people who are in the audience here today, um, welcome. Thank you so much, Andy Georgina, for that beautiful welcome. I uh, really, really appreciate that. And um, to Professor Christensen, I can say your name. <laughs> um, and Professor Gunston, uh, thank you so much for the um, wonderful introduction to this event. Um, so when you look outside um, on, on a... Well, maybe not tonight, because there's clouds everywhere, but if we went outside on a non-cloudy night, um, in, in Hawthorne, we'd, we'd look up at the sky and we might see um, stars, we might see maybe a 200, 300 stars if we're lucky, we'll see some planets and if it's the right um, time of month we'll see the moon. However, if you go into um, the dark, so you go away from the city lights, go where there are no, um, no other lights, we're, we're just illuminated by the night sky. And um, if you've experienced this, which I'm sure many of you in the audience have, and if you haven't done it recently, please, please make a weekend away where you go camping and, and experience this. You'll experience the universe engulfing you. Um, it's not like you're standing on Earth and then there's the stars out there. You really feel, feel actually part of our own galaxy and part of the universe. Um, we've heard today about how... Um, Indigenous um, Australian astronomers were potentially and probably the first astronomers. And we're going to discuss a little bit about what that means um, for the rich heritage for um, astronomy in Australia and what we can learn um, from our Indigenous heritage in this area. So the qu first question I'm going to direct to Uncle Wayne. Welcome. Thank you so much for being on the panel. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us from your perspective, um, what does um, the um, astronomy mean to you in terms of um, Indigenous culture in Australia? Thank you very much. But first I'd like to thank Georgina for the wonderful welcome and respect, show my respect to the, her countrymen and her ancestors. In fact, we're neighbours in, in our clan countries, Gunma countries to the east, and the Kulin Nations to our west. So, yeah, thank you very much. Very important to acknowledge the country that we're on. Um, but back to your question, it's, I, I find um, our, our connection to astronomy very important. Um, before we had mobile phones and iPads and the internet and all the different apps that come with it, um, we had to rely on our observation and our connection to country. So a part of looking at the stars um, and the night sky, we're really reading our calendar of events. Um, we're looking to see what sort of foods are in season. We're, we're looking to, to see the indicators that, that tell us when ceremonies are about to happen. Um, and therefore, we need to start moving towards that ceremony or that grounds where the ceremony is going to be. Um, and along the way, we know what food sources are available. So we, we always travelled light, um, but we've got a big kitchen. Um, <laughs> early Australians sort of write stories about us that we're just hunters and gatherers aimlessly wandering across the country, looking, chasing the game. <laughs> but no, we've got a big kitchen and we're, we're going to that food source and that food source grows in them areas, so that's where we've got to go. It's a little bit like when you're in your kitchen, you've got to go to your fridge for the frozen goods, but you go to the pantry for all the dry goods. Um, but ours is spread out a little bit more. So the, the stars help tell us that. That's, that's the connection with the stars. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And um, I think that what we've learnt really, especially in recent years, is that um, Indigenous um, knowledge can help um, us in interpreting modern science. And I was wondering, um, Dwayne, if you'd be able to comment on that a little bit, please. Sure. Thanks. And thanks, Auntie, for the welcome. 
and recognize the traditional owners here as well. It's, it's interesting approaching this question from my perspective because I grew up in the US. I knew nothing about Australia other than what I saw in Crocodile Dundee, quite literally. You laugh, but I'm serious. Um, <laughs> When I came to Australia, you know, I, I came to study astrophysics. I didn't have anything in the back of my mind saying I had to come down here to learn about traditional knowledge. I became interested in the crossroads of science and culture, um, probably when I was an undergraduate studying physics in the University of Missouri. And when I came to Australia, it, it was probably the most amazing experience I ever had. Australia was the first place I'd ever been to that felt like home, even more than you know, where I'm from in a state of misery, as I always called it. Um, and I began to become interested, you know, learning about, well, you know, what, what do the people here think about astronomy? And when I asked a few people, I, I didn't get a very positive response, um, which didn't entirely surprise me because a lot of the other study abroad students were taking the first year indigenous studies courses and telling me, you know, a lot about what happened. I was taking, like, the advanced astrophysics courses when I was in Sydney. But I became very curious about this. I thought, well, Surely, for as long as people have been here, there's got to be more to it than what people would tell me is, oh, there's a few myths and legends and stories about it. a couple names of stars, but that's all. I thought that, that doesn't quite seem to match up right. And I, after a couple of years, I decided I wanted to pursue my career looking at the crossroads of astronomy and culture with respect to Aboriginal cultures here in Australia, because I was lucky to meet a couple of elders who were very good at sort of teaching me a lot about how knowledge is viewed in Australia. And it's as diverse as there are Aboriginal communities, of which there are hundreds of distinct Aboriginal nations across the country. And it also became apparent to me that there were certain things I could learn and certain things I couldn't. Um, I could learn about the culture a bit, but I could never really learn the culture. I didn't grow up speaking language or in a community. I didn't have those connections and those roots. But being an astronomer, having a background in astrophysics, um, I was armed with the tools necessary to see the science behind the traditional knowledge. And when I began learning from the elders, and even going back and reading the old archival documents, which were largely written by mostly white male ethnologists and missionaries with their own heavy biases, um, I noticed something that was not acknowledged. This comes into the truth-telling part. <clears throat> something that, was acknowledged, that wasn't acknowledged and wasn't being recognized is that there, there are multiple layers and levels to all this knowledge that I learned about. And one layer of that, one of the foundational levels of that, is about science. And when I ask people about indigenous science or aboriginal science, they just sort of look at me like, what are you talking about? And that was the problem, this whole narrative that there's no science here. Aboriginal people didn't have that kind of stuff. It's like Uncle Wayne said, just sort of wandering around aimlessly. Well, that's total rubbish. And having the eyes of an astronomer, I could recognize there's a lot there that nobody had really tapped into, nobody had really understood. And then I realized that was probably the best area for me to go into as part of this truth-telling process, is to learn from the elders. They teach me a lot. I do a lot of my work in Murray Island, Mare, in the Torres Strait. And the levels of knowledge the elders teach me is unreal. I know they've barely even scratched the surface with me, um, but there's a tremendous level of knowledge there that is scientific. It does tell about the world around us, the formation processes, how things happen, why things happen, how they're interlinked, and how they're used for predictive purposes. And at the core, that's what science is. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, Crystal, welcome. Um, thanks so much for being on the panel. Uh, I know that you're um, currently doing your studies at Monash University um, as a science student. Um, and um, you were telling me earlier about a project you're doing about the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that research. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, sort of through my university, um, largely with the help of Dwayne, uh, Dr. Dwayne here, and um, my supervisor on Monash, I'm able to explore, like I'm an astrophysics student, and I'm able to explore that cross-section between my culture and also with my scientific studies. Um, and so I'm currently working on a project which focuses on the Pleiades uh, star cluster, so, which is also known as the Seven Sisters, probably more popularly um, around. And uh, I'm looking into the different ways they were interpreted in different oral traditions. So the oral traditions or the stories um, from different Aboriginal communities across Australia, they have quite a lot of differences, and then in some cases they have quite a lot of similarities, and that's within the way they're described or how they're interpreted. 
Um, and so we see this sort of common theme of um, this number of seven, and sometimes that disappears. Maybe it'll become six or five, depending on the community. Um, and I'm really interested into why that happens. So not only the interpretation as to why we sometimes tend to see these groups of seven stars as a group of seven women or seven girls, but also um, why that number changes sometimes from seven to six. And so this is where I get to bring in, um, use this sort of cultural knowledge, but also bring in this, you know, my handy dandy computer and SDS <laughs> surveys <laughs> um, to look at the spectral data um, of each star. Um, because it seems as though some of these stars that are within this cluster, they vary in brightness. And, you know, it, it seems that potentially what I'm looking into is a descriptor of a variable star in many different ancient or many different Aboriginal oral tradition, traditions, which is really exciting for me because I think variable stars are really cool. <laughs> but essentially, in a nutshell, that is what I'm looking into. Is it true that you can only see six of the seven stars with the naked eye? Um, to my knowledge, sort of currently, yes, I guess it depends on what your observation conditions are, and that's also what I'm looking into, because um, it's sort of approaching it from three points. So it's looking at the interpretations and how they're described in these stories, um, looking at the stellar data and to seeing that variation with them, but also, I guess, the, the biology behind the human eye, sort of what is our seeing capacity, what were the conditions sort of, um, I guess, over time when these observations would have been made, and sort of just trying to make sense of that because um yeah essentially what we see really sort of six stars quite easily and that's sort of that seventh that sort of pops up once in a while which we're yeah a bit perplexed about so thank you so much um so i was wondering um if you can talk a little bit more broadly how you think that um aboriginal astrophysics students can bridge the the two worlds i guess between culture and science so um, I guess I can only really speak from my perspective and what I'm hoping to achieve through my studies and where I'm heading in my, I guess, field. Um, I think we can bring, for one, for one point, a lot of truth. Um, I know that growing up I've learned quite a lot about Greek astronomy and that sort of, you know, the Greeks and the Egyptians being the, the oldest evidence we have of astronomers and that's sort of the basis that we go off of from our, like, history lessons, I guess. Um, and to know that we are not only, like, there are you know, many cultures out there who have a much longer history of like astronomical science, but also that we're literally on the country of these nations. Uh, I think it's a bit sad that this isn't something that's properly taught. And so I'm really happy that I get to sort of come in and use my platform as an astrophysics student to start weaving in that traditional knowledge. And it's been received quite well so far. And I think that's something that we can really bring to the table. I mean, obviously, everyone came out here to talk or to listen to us talk about it. And I know quite a lot of universities are really interested in integrating this into the studies. So I feel like we can sort of offer those traditional perspectives and really highlight this area as a point of focus. Thank you very much. Um, Uncle Wayne, I was just wondering if you could tell us um, a little bit more about um, the most important aspects of astronomy in your culture and um, are there any particular um, constellations that mean something to you um, within your culture that um, we would, um, I guess we'd know in the Western world, um, but I'd like to hear from your perspective as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I've grown up learning all the, the Western astronomy, um, but then along the way I've had elders point out some constellations and tell me that, see that three stars up there with that thing that they call the, the pot. Well, at certain times of the year, um, he said, well, that pot will scoop up the evening light, travel throughout the night, and then tip out the morning. And I thought, wow. How do you, how do you, you know that happens? Well, you've got to sit up with me all night and watch it. <laughs> So, so that was one of the things, and, and that's what they call Orion's belt. Um, but looking into our ceremonies, our traditional ceremonies, initiations and our timings, and them three stars have got to do with the ceremony ground for our young people to go through from child to adulthood. And then talking with people like Dwayne, and realising that the, the Orion Nebula, the handle of the pot, is also the birthplace for many stars. 
I thought, well, that fits. Uh, that fits with our stories. Um, the birthplace of many stars. It's also the birthplace of many of our people going through the law, going through the initiation ceremony. Um, so, and, and again, that's, that's a first stage for, for our young ones. Again, there's many levels of learning um, and uh, many levels of knowledge and wisdom. It's a little bit like you've got primary school, you've got kindergarten, you've got primary school, tertiary, then you've got universities. So it's the same, similar sort of thinking there like that. But um, the, the Southern Cross that a lot of people got tattoos of and, you know, makes them Australian and all this kind of, our Australians, you know, so it's, it's, but the Southern Cross for us, in particular the Gunai people, um, is a tree for us. This tree is part of a story that was across the river where Naren, the man that become on the moon, he was crossing, looking to go and get the emu across the other side of the river. He had to find somewhere where he could cross. He, he found the tree falling and across the, the, the river. He started crossing that, that, um, that tree, but then all of a sudden the dingo appears come out from behind the other bushes and within that dingo was a nasty spirit. That nasty spirit seen Naren trying to cross the, the tree, twisted the tree, Naren fell off. His reflection went to the moon, to the grandmother moon, and he, he become a, one of the dark shades on the moon. The nasty spirit, Burum, become on the, the right hand side. The river, we picture that as the river of the Milky Way. The tree is the southern cross across the river. So all these things uh, go with our stories. Um, the, the name of Burunda is also the name of the Tambo River in, in my people's country, in Ghana country, a place called Burden. And um, so it has significance for us. And that, that man on the moon, we, we see really two figures and a part of that story, the, the man on the left, you, you'll see he's reaching up for a high mark or in AFL, just for the screamer. <laughs> so he's taking the screamer. But um, for us, he's playing the game Mangrook. And Mangrook, the ball, represents the moon. And so within the game, we didn't bounce the ball. The ball was made of possum fur and stuffed with grasses, different things. So it's not, not able to bounce. So you had to keep it in the air. And a part of our game was to do the high mark. We didn't call it screamer back then. We, we call it mark dajan. So real good, it was well done. And then I heard a linguist talk about one time saying that um, the AFL never come from the game Mangrook and there is no word in the Aboriginal languages saying mark, meaning catch. I thought to myself, no, it, it doesn't mean that. It means great. It was a good, a good movement or a good thing to do. I, I looked up the, the English dictionary and the word screamer doesn't word mean catch either. <laughs> So I thought, but yeah, there, there's some of the things that, that um, really come about with, with me. Um, looking at some of, some, of them, some of the stories within archives, um, not all of them tell a twisted story, but some of the archives uh, have got some, some useful and true to stories within it. And so we, we tend to look at them and, and revisit and restore and then recreating um, and piecing our culture back together from the history of this country. So we're piecing our, our culture together and, and we look at these sort of things, but rather than taking them for face value written by someone else, we like to take them out on country and have a look for ourselves and make sure that we can bring them back to a, a true nature. Um, and, and one of the things that, that uh, looking at astronomy for me is 
over the years, there's been so much denial about our culture, the existence of our culture, or the intelligence of our culture, or anything of our culture. And they put in our children's story, uh, ch uh, stories on the children's shelves. And I often think, well, that's the level of the people putting them on the shelf, at children's level. They're not aware of all the different levels that, that of intelligence. And so by looking at astronomy and the stars and the timing of it, and therefore the science of it, and the quantum physics of it, and all the sort of different sciences that, that come with it that we hear about now, but we didn't recognize it as, as all that back then. But it's something that people can't deny. It's there. And it will be over there not too long ago uh, after that. And when you see that star there, you'll know that this red flower here is, is going to be flowering. And then therefore, that animal is going to be eating that red flower. So now we can get a feed of that animal, as well as that fruit, that other tree that's next to that tree. So it's, it's that sort of stuff. It's, it's having a look at the, the holistic nature um, within a few indicators that are there um, throughout the seasons. So yeah. I think that's an absolutely um, incredible example and something that uh, maybe a lot of Australians um, don't um, realise around um, Indigenous and Aboriginal astronomy is the way that you can use the stars to understand what is happening on Earth. And um, I, I read a a really lovely piece by um, Crystal on Indigenous X recently, where she described um, how you, yeah, this exact, exact fact. Um, so this week, um, obviously, is Reconciliation Week, and the um, the theme is um, grounded in truth, um, walk together in courage, and um, it was really um, wonderful to read earlier in this year that um, the. Uh, indigenous astronomy has made it to the Australian school curriculum um, and I think this is going to be a really f fantastic step forward in um, educating um, our population around um, the the truths I guess of of this area and Dwayne I know that you played a really big role in this and I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about it and then Crystal I'd like to find out from you what you think about it as well. <laughs> Thank I smile you. to think of it away. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really, it was really an honor. Uh, sort of later last year, Professor Marcia Langton at the University of Melbourne uh, invited me in to have a discussion because the Prime Minister and Cabinet Office of Prime Minister and Cabinet had commissioned her to lead the development of the Australian National Curriculum to incorporate astronomy, fire, and water um, into the tertiary, uh, not tertiary. Uh, primary and secondary education system. So she asked me to come in and, and write the stuff for the indigenous astronomy section. Uh, so this includes all the different subjects, not just science and math, but like English and health and phys ed and technology and arts and all this, you know, the full breadth of it. So I sat down for a while to try to think of how can we really do this? It's these, these are meant to be education modules that teachers can take at their discretion and incorporate into the classroom. We've got a long way to go yet, um, but it's a starting point. And it's, it's come quite late, but it's, you know, at least we're doing it now, which is good. So I thought, you know, what sorts of content can we bring in? We don't want to keep rehashing the same thing over again. We want to bring in some fresh material. We want to bring in stuff directly from the communities, from the elders, from the knowledge custodians. And we want to be able to do this in such a way that not only does it build on each other between uh, primary and secondary school, but that it really showcases some of the depth of the knowledge. So for year five, for example, mathematics, um, I developed a curriculum to talk about navigation. Now, people always think about navigation, you know, usually the Polynesians come up or the Vikings come up or something like that. And yes, they did have really good navigation systems, but so did Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, you know, it's going to be quite different if you're in Walpuri country in the desert versus if you're in the Torres Strait, which is on the sea, of course. Um, but using the stars as a map 
is one of the things the elders have taught me the most. And they've taught me about reading the stars, how to read the changes and the properties of the stars, how to look at things like the twinkling of stars. That was one of the things that blew me away the most uh, when I was learning from the elders on Mare in Murray Island. So we looked at different ways we could incorporate this stuff across the curriculum, build it from years five up to year eight, because those are the two main levels that we looked at, and, and just find links across those areas that we can build upon. And in due time, you know, this is meant to be for all subjects from like preschool all the way to PhD. Unfortunately, we're doing some of that with the undergraduate degrees at some of the universities in physics. It's in the right direction, but what we're still doing is saying, here's the Western education system. We're just gonna sort of piece your stuff in there. That's not really how we want to do it. I mean, I think tearing it all down and starting over again is going to be a little bit of a challenge, but that's kind of what needs to be done in the end. Um, but these are, these are ways we can start to move forward and integrate these two knowledge systems. And what I, what I really like, as Wonka Wayne said before, is, is not just looking at traditional knowledge um, as some kind of relic from the past as a museum piece, but something that is contemporary, that's modern, that is still around. Because Western science changes all the time. We're always rewriting history every day. You know, we're always finding out new stuff. And the same goes for everything I've learned from the elders. So why not look at ways those two areas can work together? So if you're teaching students about astrophysics and you're looking at star formation and you look at the Orion Nebula, why not bring in some of the aboriginal traditions that talk about similar things? You're not saying they're exactly the same thing, but you're showing ways these two worlds can come together and students can learn from two different perspectives. Thank you. Crystal. So um, I'm... I was very excited to hear this announcement and that's um, why I got to write my piece essentially on why I think it's such a great thing and why I wanted everyone else to understand that it can be quite valuable. Um, I think especially growing up um, like as an Aboriginal child through you know the Australian sort of public school system, you grow up with a really warped view. So essentially you're hearing a bit of a different story from what you'd be hearing from your family. You're hearing like, oh yes, th these nomadic wanderers and there was, you know, essentially nothing really here and they couldn't count to four and, you know, just a lot of stuff. And I've heard from a lot of my own professors, so much older than I, that <laughs> like they had a similar experience but to an even worse degree. Um, and it's quite sad because I think it really impacts on a, quite a lot of Indigenous Australians the way you start to see yourself because how can you see um, yourself and your culture as anything different than what's been fed to you by the public? by like everyone told to your grandparents, to your parents, to yourself. Um, so I think for me, um, my, my life's passion heading into this is helping rewrite that and changing it so that anyone onwards is able to grow up with quite a lot of pride that they should have been having from the get-go and to not being hearing a lot of these myths that are used to sort of break us down. Um, so starting with Indigenous astronomy, um, I think it's absolutely incredible that we have such a a long history of it and that a lot of not only Indigenous students but non-Indigenous students get to recognise this and be proud about the land that they're on and the history that is here and the amount of knowledge that is here. There's incredible things. I could honestly go on all night about the different topics that are within Indigenous astronomy. There have been amazing discoveries, such things as variable stars, things that in Western astronomy or modern, you know, astronomy or whatever, um, we have known to be true or existing for the last couple hundreds of years, which pop up in oral traditions. And some of these oral traditions as well date back from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of years. It is incredible. And also, also something that's really important is this land that we're currently on, it's been colonized, what, 200 years ago. We've approached it with quite a, like a colonial perspective. We're doing things to the land that isn't, weren't developed here on this continent. They were developed in other country, these sort of practices. But also, um, if we actually take the time to look into different indigenous oral traditions, they describe quite a lot of the history that's happened here. So even if it's volcanic eruptions within our state, whether it be um, fire falling from the sky, which we know to be meteorite and impacts, there's so much to learn. And I'm, I'm just really excited that it's not only something that indigenous students can take on board and to start to, I guess, walk with a lot more pride than what's being forced down their throats in a negative light, but also for all of us in general across the country to realise how lucky we are, how much knowledge is here and something to be super proud of because it is the oldest continuing culture and seems to be the world's first astronomers and there is amazing knowledge within that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much and it's just absolutely wonderful to have you here and with so much passion and so much knowledge. It's really, really fantastic. Um, 
So I guess um, moving on to something that really worries me, and you're talking about development um, and colonial development on our, our current lands, um, which is leading to a lot of light pollution. And as I said at the beginning, when we go outside at the moment, we, we might see 200 stars and we're not really seeing the, the wealth of, of information out there. And um, not, not just for the science, but for, uh, for understanding um, what is happening on on, on the ground. And so I was just wondering um, what you think as a panel of the importance of dark skies when you're looking at city planning and um, whether we should limit dark skies to some remote sites um, so just so that we can do it occasionally or whether we should have sort of a, a much more broad policy so that we can all see the night sky. Who'd like to take that? Um, maybe they should build the bio Tower of Babel again, so they can get above the light pollution. <laughs> <laughs> All these different multicultural people here. Um, but it, it does. It, it, it does affect. It. When I was living in, in the suburbs of Preston and Reservoir and stuff, I rarely seen the stars. Well, mostly because I was inside all the time. <laughs> But that's the difference between our ancestors, always outside, um, and use shelters when we needed, and when there was a great food source, well then, that had the, the huts and the villages. Um, but you're not always inside watching TV. Um, our TV was the campfire, um, and we're looking at and seeing our visions of our dreaming through that fire. So we're always outside and we always take a notice of what's happening within nature and the stars. Um, one of the language words for, for one of my great-great-grandfathers was Gulda. Gulda is the job of taking notice of what's happening in the stars, observing the stars. So um, part of his job was to know what's, what's in the stars to know what's in the wind, to know what's in the warmth, the cold, all the different things, to know what the, the people should be doing and, and um, where we should be moving to. So it tells us all the different information. Being inside all the time, um, regulating that heater or that air con um, to make sure we're comfortable um, and go into that fridge and that pantry, we, we don't have to go outside or we dial a pizza and we don't have to go outside, we miss out on all that, as Bruce Lee said, don't focus on the finger, you miss all of that heavenly glory. So by being inside, by being in, in towns and cities, we miss out on all the information that them stars are, are always telling us. Go so many k's outside of that light pollution and you'll see it. So, Thank you. Because so, I know you have some amazing things to say, because the things that jump to the forefront of my mind are things that you've told me, which are very exciting. So I just want to say from a small perspective, for me, I think Dark Sky is really important for igniting that passion that could exist within quite a lot of kids. Um, for me, I, the reason I am into astrophysics or astronomy is because I grew up in a rural town, and the skies there are beautiful. My sister's there, she can agree with me. When in the CBD in our town, you can see quite a lot of stars, but just going out to our home, you see everything. It is phenomenal. And so I always had questions I wanted to know more. It's an experience that we all have right above us every single night, or if it's not raining. Um, but it was just absolutely amazing. And for me, I wanted to find out more. It always kept me wondering. And I just feel like that's something that a lot of kids or anyone will start to miss out on if we keep, I guess, sort of improperly lighting our areas and you know populations growing cities are growing i fear that it'll even reach out to our rural cities as well so i that's my personal reason for thinking we should focus on it thank you so i, I grew up in in a country town had a population of about 45 people who can beat that <laughs> yeah right uh, we had more cows than people but i grew up as one of those kids fascinated with the stars and i, I learned from a very young age about our human connection to the stars. We've always had that. It's always been, you know, a, an integral element of everything we do. What the elders have taught me over the years, there's been a few phrases that have come out, but one in particular is everything on the land is reflected in the sky. That the sky serves as a textbook, as a law book, as a memory space. 
everything here is also up there. If you can't see that, how are you going to remember anything down here? And we have this connection. Wildlife has this connection. There are dung beetles in Africa that navigate using the Milky Way. You know, there are turtles. Uh, the islanders told me that the turtles, when they hatch on the beach, they learn to see the reflections in the water. They use the moon. The moon lights the water up. They know to go to that. Now, because of all the light pollution along these beaches, there's lights, you know, bars and clubs and hotels. The turtles are going in towards that instead of the moon because it's so much brighter and they're getting run over. Like, there's a lot of ways that, that we connect to the stars and that animals connect to the stars, animals navigate using the stars, and all the light pollution is killing that. It's destroying our connection. And most of us don't really look up, even those that are astronomers, we only really look up, you know, when we're doing some kind of outreach event. How many people know what constellation is rising in the sky right now, rising in the east? Who can tell me? <laughs> right? What planet is rising in the east right now, just below that constellation? Who knows? Ooh. A couple of people, oh yeah, the, the astronomers, right? <laughs> the point is, most of us, I think, if we still had that connection, we'd all be able to say, oh, yes, it's Scorpius, or whatever constellation you want to call it with those stars. In the Western traditions, it's Scorpius. Um, and Jupiter is just below that right now. We don't know that right away. But we've lost that connection. And when we lose that connection, we don't think about it. And when it's not in our mind, it's easy for us to get rid of it. You know, we have, we have to go out in the desert to see it. We have to drive two hours out of the city to be able to see and appreciate the skies. And the first time any of us go out and we've seen those amazing skies for the first time, I mean, how many people just sort of had, you know, gasped and were like, oh my God, what is that, you know? I had it when I came to Australia, because you get much better skies in the Southern Hemisphere than we do in the Northern Hemisphere. There's a lot more stuff to see down here. I don't know if anybody realizes that or not. And many of you realize there's a lot more stuff to see down here. And the skies are so much more populated with, you know, the Magellanic Clouds and the Milky Way and all this other stuff. So the point is, if we don't find solutions to mitigating light pollution and reconnect with the sky, we're going to lose a huge chunk of our heritage. But there are ways we can find solutions. And these come with the marriage of two very different organizations you wouldn't think would work together. The astronomers, the Aboriginal communities, and the city planners, the industrial light people. You know, you think they'd only be at loggerheads with each other. But we're looking at ways we can work together on this. How can we mitigate this? Because the fact of the matter is, we're not going to be able to stop urban sprawl. It's going to happen. I don't like necessarily to think about that, but it's going to happen. But how can we mitigate that? If you use the right kind of lighting, if you angle it in the right way, there, there's places you can go where you can see the ground illuminated, but you can't even really tell where the light's from. Those are places where the right people have done the work to ensure that light isn't going up, it's going down, and it's the right kind of light. Everybody knows about LED lights, right? We've got a lot of, you know, car headlights, phones, street lights, everything. LED lights are actually a nightmare for wildlife. They're a nightmare for our health. I mean, on our phones, you can actually do the, the blue light reduction because of LED, and it's terrible for light pollution because blue light scatters. You know, it's a, Blue light scatters, a really scattering sort of thing. Um, it's really bad for us. So finding the right kind of lights, like amber LEDs, which are really useful, people don't think about that. But they're more in the, the red or yellow end of the spectrum. By finding the right kinds of ways that we can take industry, cultural heritage, and astronomy, and bring those together, we can find some amazing solutions in this space and not lose our heritage. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I think um, we actually have to end the panel on that note, but maybe with a call to action for us to go to our local councils and um, see if we can get involved in the, in the planning process. Um, but I'd like to um, turn it over to Professor Gunston, who is going to take questions from the audience. Thank you very much for such a wonderful discussion. Thanks. <laughs> We've got time for a couple of questions. Um, we've got some microphones, so, uh, yep. Just, um. Um, I was just wondering, in Tasmania, quite often on and off during the year, people can see the Aurora Australis. I was wondering if there are Aboriginal stories or explanations about that, although perhaps it's hardly ever seen in Victoria. Yeah, I found one story where, where it talked about um, fire in the sky and, and flood. And within the archives, they, they said that it was the Aurora Australis, the Southern Lights. 
But then I'm doing some research about it. I thought, well, the Royal Australis wouldn't be hot enough to melt the last ice age or make a flood. So I sort of started looking what, what was the cause to make the fire in the sky, the sky go red, like a fire in the sky, um, and therefore make a flood. So it come down to either a, a comet or meteorite or volcanoes. So besides that, I, I really haven't got a, a story of, of the Aurora Australis. I published a paper on it. So there's, uh, there's lots of views of the Aurora across the southern half of the country. And what might surprise a lot of people, there are Aboriginal traditions about the Aurora from Queensland to Nuluru. You know, it can actually be seen, technically it can be seen from anywhere on the Earth, as long as the conditions are right. You get one of these big solar mass ejections, corona mass ejections. Um, often seen as, as fire, uh, tends to be described in the color red more. And that's the fun thing about marrying, uh, marrying science and culture in this way, is when you look at the auroral zones that sort of band around the poles, Borealis in the north, Australis in the south, where you see the aurora, it's sort of between Australia and um, Antarctica. But because the really high altitude aurora tend to be red, and the lower altitude aurora tend to be green, not always the case, but kind of tends to be that way, and because we're looking so far away, because, you know, the Earth is round, um, people are seeing those higher red aurora glowing along the horizon. So it, it's really great to be able to see some of these stories and recognize the traditions. And just to shamelessly promote this here, if anybody wants to know anything more about Aboriginal astronomy, including um, the detailed astronomy of several different communities across the country, or by subject level, if you want to know about aurora, or meteors, or the Pleiades, or anything else related to Aboriginal astronomy, we do have an extensive website at aboriginalastronomy.com.au. So go check that out, and pretty much you go navigating through there, there's profiles of these guys, you know, there's everything you can find on there, TEDx talks and everything else that link to that. So aboriginalastronomy.com.au, you can find almost everything there. And so within that, I'm just not sure how many people are aware that even though we're called Aboriginal people, we are 500 different nationalities in that sense. Over, you know, so many different language groups, um, so many different cultures, therefore so many different countries. Yes, it's one landmass, but there's, we're not um, all the same people. Just like Europe's got a, a one landmass, how many language groups are there? Uh, I don't know either, but, <laughs> but, but there's, there's more than one. So it's not just Aboriginal people, so there are different stories, different for the same constellations, but there's differences. Okay, so look, we've run right out of time, so we don't have any more time for questions, but, oh, sorry. Thank you. As a Gundich Mara elder, I feel privileged and very proud of both of you kids down there. It does my old heart good. I've worked... <laughs> I have worked for 50 years waiting for the moments like this to see our people stand up and tell our stories. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you very much. That's a wonderful night to end on, so thank you very much. Thank I'd you, to Uncle. Thank the that's, panelists that's and the chair once again. And that's a little bit why I was so nervous, because it's hard to talk in front of my elders. Because <laughs> I know they're looking. And <laughs> Thanks. I'd like to thank the staff from the Dani Terminal Centre, the Centre for Astrophysics and Supercomputing, and University Advancement, and most particularly Simone Hamlin, for their fantastic work of putting this lecture together. Thank you. Thanks.